Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, I'm doing, I'm doing, as we say Look sometimes. Uh, thank you. Still, you know, still hovering around 30 pounds I lost. Uh, I get my mind to it, I'm going to go to 35, but I got to got to get my mind to it. When the WBC calls me to make weight, then I will. <laughs> um, you know, then I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But, um, you know, some of us over the weekend, when we're not talking fights, um, some of our crew here, our family of uh, this podcast, some if they're not drinking athletic greens, they're running marathon, marathons. So I want to... I wanna, Congratulate our producer Rob, uh, who ran. I know he ran a half marathon in the Malibu, uh, over in Malibu, half marathon. And I know there was some real monsters. You would speak to it better than me, but there was some real monsters in there, evident of their times that they ran. And he came in fourth. In a again, it's to me, it's kind of like looking at the record of a fighter. It's not the record; it's who you fought. You know, yep. it's not the place of one, two, three, or four. It's who was in the race. And um, considering that, uh, I thought I should congratulate him, but mostly for this reason, that he was in the front uh, setting the pace with two other guys who both ended up running a 109.15. Again, you could speak to what that kind of time is for a half marathon. It sounds pretty incredible to me. Uh, a 109.15, and he was hoping that they would, you know, that they would give in a little bit, that they would uh, not be able to maintain that kind of pace. And he knew going in that he shouldn't set that kind of pace, but he also, you know, he, he understood that when you're running a sub 520, five minutes and 20 second mile, that that's not the pace that he would prefer to be at, that he would rather come off the pace. But he kept at it. And the reason he kept at it was because he didn't, as he said to you and me, he didn't get in the race to come in second or third. He got in the race to win. And he made a decision right there. So that's what made me tell him and why I'm giving him this credit on the show, which he deserved, he earned it, by making that choice. Once he made that choice, and I want to speak to this to all people out there in whatever marathon you're running in life, because it's never a sprint in life. It's a marathon, believe me. So, And you guys are figuring that out. So whatever your fight is in life, you know, it's about the choice you make, the commitment you made. He prepared for it, and at that point, he made a choice to win. Once he made that choice to win, for me, he's a winner because that forced him. He didn't submit. He could have submitted. He could have made a choice to coast to say, no, you know, some other time I'll come in maybe a little better. But no, he made a commitment to winning. That is the definition of winning, definition of a winner. When you make that commitment and even when it's at your peril, which it was at his peril at the end of the day. But once you make that choice, then no, I'm, to, I'm in. I'm, I'm in to win. I'm not in to survive. I mean, there's too many people in life today that are in it to exist. I'm sorry, but they are. They're in it to survive. No, we should be in it to win. It doesn't mean we're going to win, but it means that that's your commitment, that that's your goal. And it also means something else, that... Rob will be left with. It means that you're forcing yourself to open other doors in your own house, as I often talk about on this show, in yourself, in your own world. You're forcing yourself to open other doors that otherwise wouldn't be open. And by opening those doors, you're going into places you otherwise wouldn't go into. And you're finding out more about yourself than you would have found out about yourself. Stuff that you're going to use down the road. Stuff that is going to let you stay in first place because of what you learned, because of the way you went, because of the choice you made, because of the doors that you opened up by making that choice. So I just want to tell him, 
he's our producer, he's our partner on this show, that you won, in my estimation. And you give me a chance to say this to many people out there, that is a teaching moment, a teaching moment of life. So um, that's it. That's, uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, I should also mention that uh, Rob was the defending champion, I think, for almost four years in a row, if I'm not mistaken. Either myself or Rob has won that race. So there was a lot of pressure on it. He knew he had to go for the win. But like I said, you can never control who shows up. And at the end of the day, Rob and I are uh, weekend warriors and uh, just trying to be the best we can be. But we're just now listen, not I don't professional give a damn. runners. I don't give a damn who shows up. To me, yep. that's not the point. To me, the point yep. is what I said, that that I, I don't give a freak if Flash showed up. Or, or my, <laughs> my um, <laughs> but Flash don't have endurance. He can go only go quick, he, you know, real fast. Bop! You know, but he don't, I don't think he has that endurance. But um, or who's the other guy? My grandson's favorite guy, and he runs all over now the place. My grand, there's a there's new Sonic, guy. There's Sonic, a, no Sonic, Sonic. Sonic. I can't yeah, believe Sonic. you knew who Sonic was. Son- I was well, say, of, but how could I not? I, I, it's Sonic. I watch him <laughs> with my grandson at night, and and um, so I said to him, he was running really fast the other day. He goes, Papa, watch this, bam, and he's run. I said, Wow, you're fast. You're like Flash. No, I'm Sonic. Um, yeah, Sonic <laughs> is better than Flash. Yep. So the point that I'm making um, is the point I made, that I don't care if Sonic and Flash both show up. You Once you're in, you're in. And you make yep. that choice to win, you're a winner. And um, more of us should make those choices. And again, there's no losing when you make that choice because of what I just said and the way I just explained it because it forces you to go further than you normally would have went. That makes you better. That sets the stage to win later. So anyway, um, the other thing I want to say before we start talking fights uh, instead of track is we we live in a very special country, uh, a great country. Where we we have our problems, just like families have problems. But we we have a we have a special family, and we've been having a lot of problems recently, um, and many. Many years ago, you know, you guys have heard about, you know, the great generation and all that. And every generation's got its greatness. But where these young men went out there to war for World War I, World War II, and they went out there to save our country, to give us everything we have today, quite frankly, without getting too dramatic about it. But the truth is the truth. And with all the great things that their lives, which many of them lost their lives, were put on a line to gain for us. All the rights in this country of freedoms that we enjoy because of them. One of the greatest rights that we have in this great country, full of great rights, is our right to vote. Today is Monday. We do our show on Monday, and then it goes up tomorrow. Tomorrow is election day. I just wanted to take a moment to remind all the people out there, the people that died to give you this right, use it. You're not happy with what's going on? You're not happy with your elected officials? Guess what? You get to fire them. (laughs) Guess what? (laughs) You, You get to remind them that this country is for the people, of the people, I should say of the people, for the people. That's you, the people. It's not for them. It's not of them. They work for you. And I just, again, sometimes we need reminders. Use that great privilege, that great right that people died to make sure that you had. Use it. You're not happy with what's going on in the world, whatever. Go out there. You can change it. Use your vote. It means something. It counts. People went and they gave everything to make sure that you had that right. That's it. Let's talk boxing and maybe a little UFC, MMA too. I don't know. Whatever you throw at me, I'm ready. Yeah. Let's jump right in on the undercard of the um, the uh, Bevo versus Ramirez fight. We had a, a couple, couple good ones. 
Um, Rakamov, a shove cut. Rakamov took on Zelfa Barrett, and uh, Rakamov got off the deck uh, and, and and to win it by stoppage in the ninth round. And I know you watched that one. Just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, listen. Um, the first thing that I took umbrage with was the commentators, where they're telling us, telling me, telling us, <laughs> oh, uh, you know, all right, but they're telling, they're making a point to tell us what a good puncher Rakimov is because he's got a lot of knockouts on his record. And he's not a great puncher. He's he's a guy that never stops coming. He's like dealing with a beehive. <laughs> you can't Swarm get rid of, of this guy. The guy just keeps coming at you. The guy is beyond resilient. They should have his picture in Webster's Dictionary next to the word for the definition resilient. He 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 gets to you with pressure. Pressure breaks pipes. Pressure breaks people. He breaks you if he can break you with pressure and with an, an accumulation of punch. He's not a great puncher. And these guys are telling us just because there's a lot of knockouts there. He gets his knockouts by through submission. You know, uh, he gets them through again, through just wearing you down. And it just annoys me when they just say these things flippantly, like you're supposed to just, you know, believe it because they're telling you it. But their judgment's not good in these areas sometimes, some of them, especially the ones that were never fighters. You know, the, the ones that would never fight us, they shouldn't be telling you stuff. They should be just doing a broadcast, a play-by-play, blow-by-blow broadcast. They shouldn't be doing analytics. They really shouldn't be. I mean, in all the other sports, they re- the, the, the freaking, uh, the, the people that run the networks, the executives, the geniuses that make those decisions, you know, they, they don't put guys that were writers or guys that were, you know, that are just commentators in a position for football, basketball, baseball, whatever it is, golf. They don't put them in a position, bowling. They don't put them in a position (laughs) to talk about the analytics, analyzing the sport. They let them just do other things, but not that. They bring in Bill Parcells. They, They bring in Tony they, Romo, they bring, the best they, in football. Tony Romo. They bring in Boomer Sison, Phil Sims. You know, whoever it is, uh, they bring in the Paytons. But whoever, whoever it is, but they bring in people that are experts in that area, not you know, not people that just talk. And I, it really annoys me. I tell you. So anyway, I needed to get that off my chest, and I needed to maybe cleanse a little bit out there for the people that get given this stuff that's just wrong that you know that i can erase your 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 blackboard so to speak and start over that he's not a puncher funny thing about it the guy who was a puncher in this fight was barrett that's why he dropped him barrett was explosive barrett is a much more explosive athlete and much more you know he's got the genetics to be a puncher um And he was winning the fight, winning the fight pretty solidly early on because he controlled the outside, because he was sharper. Uh, You know, he was able to catch Rakamov coming in. Uh, You know, he was he was fighting a good fight. The problem was he wasn't resilient enough to withstand what was coming and kept coming from Rakamov. That constant, constant beat down of pressure. Ragamorf, he beats you up mentally as much as physically. He beats you up physically, and he's smart. He goes to the body, too, but he beats you up mentally, too. And that's what he did to Barrett. And it just, with a style like Ragamorf, it takes time to get going. It takes time. Again, he's kind of like you guys. You know, he's not a sprinter. He's a marathon guy. He needs time to get to you. He he ain't doing it in two, three, four rounds. He needs those middle and late rounds to get to you, to wear you down, to do what he does, to, which is just what the ocean does. Keep banging at the shore till there's no more shore. And 
I, I just, I want to give him credit for that. Um, you know, Barrett finally succumbed uh, to that to that constant, you know, banging, banging, banging that never stops with this guy. Um, I don't know how long he's going to have of a career with that style, but he's fun to watch. Uh, he, he beat you. You better be awfully tough mentally and have a good fight plan, you know, and be able to control the outside if you're going to beat him. Um, and it helps if you can punch, you know, to really try to hurt him and obviously slow him down. Um, anyway, he's, uh, like I said, he, um, I, I made a note to myself, uh, let's see, I just want to, oh, the, uh, Rakimov, a couple of the things he could improve on, he could probably press behind his jab maybe a little bit more consistently, but he could learn, someone could teach him how to cut the ring down. He's going to be doing a lot of that. Guys are going to be moving on him with his style. He, he follows too much. You know, he could be taught a little bit more about cutting down the ring a little bit. And um, his, only other, his only other shortcoming would be that he's very one-dimensional. It's always the same. But I tell you, that one dimension... Is pretty damn good. It's pretty damn tough. It's kind of like that old saying, Ken, watch that first step. It's a Lulu, you know? <laughs> uh, and and that's, watch that first dimension, that one dimension of uh, Rockamorph. It's a Lulu. So that I think that's a pretty comprehensive breakdown of uh, Rockamorph. And the reason I took time to do it, you're going to be seeing more, you know, you're going to be seeing more of this guy because of his style and because of his uh, ability to to get to guys. Yeah, agreed. Um, in the co-main, Chantel Cameron wins a one-sided unanimous decision against Jessica McCaskill. These um, these top-level girls are so busy. The, the rounds are short. There's so many punches. There's a lot of action. Always very entertaining for the most part. How'd you like that one? The fight was identical. And I, I couldn't believe that, again, commentators didn't even mention this. The fight was identical to the Rock and Wolf Barrett fight. I mean, it was the, again, it was the one dimensional pressure of McCatskill versus the more dimensional boxing of Cameron. Uh, Cameron, I mean, uh, uh, other than being women, they, it, was, it was the same. It was, you could have switched out to two fights. The only difference was that Cameron at the end wound up being more resilient, being a, not wilting the way that Barrett wilted, not being broken down to the degree. She was getting, she was getting broken down a little bit, but not to that degree. She did not allow herself to get broken down to the degree that Barrett wound up being broken down to. Um, it was a good fight. It was an interesting fight. Um, again, Cameron was the more accurate with the sharper punches, just like Barrett was early on. And she got a lead. She got a good lead early on. Uh, it was her, you know, it, it was really Cameron's uh, skills, versus the toughness and the pressure of McCatskill. I, I kind of laugh when a commentator said that McCatskill needs to get angry, you know, because I guess that's what he equates into somebody who's aggressive. <laughs> last, but I checked, get... la last I checked, Teddy, you're supposed to check your emotions at the door and be emotionless in the ring so you're not making irrational, emotional decisions. Last I checked, emotions aren't a good judge of uh, uh, decision-making. The last I checked when I train fighters, I, I get mad if they get mad. I, I said, what are you getting mad for? There's no That's room to stupid. get mad in this in this place. You get mad, you get hit easier. You don't think. Yep. People take advantage of getting mad. Um, there's no room for that, as you just spoke on. So, you know, I, I, I mean, again, it's what they equate, I guess, or a person who never fought before equates into if you're aggressive, if that's your style and someone's the better boxer, you have to get angry to beat them. No, you, you get angry, you get more beat up. 
And um, so I tweeted back, no, she don't need to get angry. She needs to move ahead. Uh, <laughs> so I was having a little fun with my tweet team, my Twitter team, um, the best in the West. And it seemed like the commentators kept making excuses for McCatskill's performance. Uh, I know she banged heads. Maybe that was something that she got hurt uh, from a headbutt um, earlier. But I, I don't know. It's, she, I, I don't know if it's just her style that it, it kind of similar, you know, to Rakimov, that it takes time to get to because of that style, that it takes time. She's not a sprinter. She's a marathon runner. And so they kept making they kept making excuses for her performance. She was losing a fight. They obviously thought she'd win or fare better. So early they just, they, they weren't given any credit really or enough credit to Cameron's fight plan and execution of it. And for me, her overall skills, you know, just like I said, just like Rockamorph with Barrett. So Cameron, the better boxer, was was really going to win unless she succumbed to the to the building and relentless pressure of Makatsko. And I tweeted that. I tweeted it during the the men's fight, you know, during the Rockamore fight, that, that Rockamore would lose unless his pressure broke down his opponent Barrett. And it did. And I tweeted the same thing, uh, that... Cameron will win unless she gets broken down. She didn't get broken down. Now, what made it such a good fight was McCatskill came on like a freight train. She really did down the stretch. Um, she ran out of track. She ran out of track, Ken. And went, And again, credit, she probably would have wished that it was a 12-round fight instead of a 10-round fight. But... Credit to both of them. Credit to McCatskill for her toughness and her just kept coming, kept coming. You know, her, her great heart and perseverance and, you know, and continuing to come forward even though she was getting hit, she was losing. But give credit to Cameron. Again, she's winning on the outside with the straighter punches, even on the inside in spots when she had to fight. And as much as she slowed down towards the end because of the McCatskill's effort, she still built enough of a lead and was in charge of herself enough, showed enough, again, resiliency and toughness, mental toughness, to not cave in completely. Um, the way that Barrett had wound up being broken down completely in the fight prior. And again, it was like a shadow fight. For me, it was... It was really amazing. It was a mirror image of the first fight. So at the end of the day, great effort by both. Uh, you know, it was it was just uh, a nice win for Cameron. Held on to win. She earned a tough victory uh, against a very game and relentless opponent. Teddy, before we talk about the main event, I just want to take a minute quickly to give a shout out to one of our newest sponsors, Ollie Pop, healthy alternative to all the traditional soda flavors you know. When am love. I going to get some? When am I going to get some? They didn't yeah, send I, it yet? No, I didn't get any. Because right I, I want to right do now. what you do. I want to drink it while we're, while we're chatting. I keep hoping that they're going to like sponsor a big fight so that the announcer, instead of saying, let's get ready to rumble, he could say, let's get it popping with Ollie Pop. Only two oh. grams of sugar compared with like 39 okay. grams from oh. um, a traditional soda. It's got that one might fiber. not go as big. That one <laughs> might not go as viral as um as what's his name Buffers, but it, it's it's it's, it's, it's got to right. be as good as it. No, maybe not as it's time. What's the other one? Uh, it's showtime. Well, the, it's showtime. Let's get it popping. Well, yeah. Um, anyway, I got to work on my that. announcer voice, but prebiotics, botanical plant fiber. Honestly, the stuff is excellent. If you're watching the show, do me a favor right now. Go to Ollie, drinkollipop.com. Use the promo code ATLAS. They'll send you some for 25% off. 
leave us a review, talk about it, help us. This is the only thing we do to like generate any revenue to help pay for the show. We have producers, we have things that cost that have, we have expenses associated. If you like the show, you want to help us support the people that subscribe subscribe to the show, subscribe to the show and support the people that support us. Olipop, drinkolipop.com, Atlas for 25% off. Main event, Teddy. One of the one of the downsides of seeing your tweets when I'm watching the fight is I have certain thoughts that I see you tweeting. I'm like, oh, I was thinking that, but I can't say I was thinking that because Teddy just tweeted it. But when they said Zerto's got him exactly where he wants him, I'm like, he's he's turning into the exact fight he wants. I'm like, the exact fight he wants. He's losing every round. His head's like a pinata. Bevel is battering him from po- pillar to post. But anyway, uh, Bevo on a one-sided beatdown of Zerto. I loved all the comments. I think it was Errol Spence who wrote, 44 and oh, who the hell is this guy fighting? <laughs> he goes to 44 and one. Bevo handles him, made it look easy. He, I, I didn't see Zerto do one single thing that gave, um, that gave Bevo a problem. And I feel bad Julia Chua, that his trainer, is a really nice guy and a good friend of mine. But, man, they um, – they were on the wrong side of a uh, wrong end of a one way street in this one. Bevo takes it easy. How'd you like it? I had said before the fight that it would all depend on whether Ramirez could close the gap enough to disrupt the rhythm of Bevo. And he could not. He could not. Um, you know, Ramirez's strength, he's a southpaw, and he throws a lot of punches. But he. It's not about throwing, it's about landing. And it's about being in position to land. He couldn't get in position and he couldn't land. And what drove me crazy, to your point, and to my point when I tweeted it, was that early on they had an even fight. I didn't have an even fight. I I might not have given a round to, I have to check my notes, but I might not have given a round to Ramirez into the 10th round. I mean, that's how... I mean, it was that dominant, I thought. I mean, you don't have to be, you know, dropping a guy 22 times in a fight to be dominant. Um, you know, I I thought he was pitching a shutout, basically. And like I said, maybe maybe you wind up 11-1, maybe 10-2. But again, these judges, to have it, yeah, they got it unanimous, thank God. But... To have it as close as they had it, I, I, I don't, again, uh, these judges, they need to get eye examinations. They, they really do. I mean, maybe they need LASIK surgery. Um, they're not a sponsor for us yet. They might become one um, when they <laughs> the do. The LASIK Institute. Uh, yes. When, when they do, Rob's going to work on that. When they do become sponsors for us, we will, we will put out, um, we will put out where you can you can a get public a, service announcement PSA yeah and and where you can get a reduction in the fee if you subscribe to our show we'll figure it out we'll we'll figure out where you know you get you get some kind of break in your LASIK surgery if you have to go that route um I, it we joke and because my my mom, who was Irish, they always had talked about the Irish sense of humor, used to say, you got to laugh, otherwise you're going to cry. So I try to laugh, but sometimes I want to cry when I look at this sport and the people running it and, and with these judges and it, it, it just just the executives, the so-called executives of this sport that really can tarnish a great sport. Really, really they can throw a damper on anything. And... Because it's not the fighters that tarnish it. It's it's the executive. It's not the sport. The sport's great. Two men getting in there to see who's the best and testing themselves in that kind of way, you know, and finding out who's willing to go to a further place than they've ever been in their life and not knowing they could go there until the moment comes. I mean, that's... That's extraordinary theater, and that's something we we get taught when we watch these guys, just like with the MMA, UFC guys. But the executives of the sport, I mean, they would they would make a prom queen look ugly. I mean, they they throw mud all over, and that's kind of how I feel they do to my sport. They always throw mud around, but 
It could have been worse. They could have robbed him. But at the end of the day, Pedro, my friend Pedro, he he had kept telling me, you know, Beaver's going to win. I agreed, but I thought there was a shot. I, it's my job to break down for the fans what the possibilities are on both sides. And then, of course, pick a winner. Yeah, I thought Beaver would win. I thought that if Ramirez could possibly break up the rhythm of Bevel, where the busier guy could start to take advantage of his ability to throw a lot of punches, maybe there could be some competitiveness, but it wasn't to be. But Pedro had said to me that, and I agreed, that watching a fight was like watching a symphony where the conductor is in charge. And that's what this was. It really was where, you know, the conductor, the maestro, whatever they call him, where he's, he's got the horn section, he's got the pipe section, he's got the, the flute section, you know, he's got the horn section, he's got the percussions, the string section, and he's got each one coming in just at the right time, just at the right time. That was beautiful. It was beautiful music. I mean, it gave a headache to Ramirez, Ken. But to me, to anyone else there, to any aficionados of the sport, of not of the sport, of anything that requires great training, great precision, great timing, great calm, great belief, you had to appreciate it. I appreciated it. Just watching him again conduct a beautiful symphony of music it really was sweet music again unless it was you your ears belonged to Ramirez and then you thought it was cymbals being smashed in your freaking head which it probably was because you got a headache at the end of the day look Beevil's not a puncher but he's accurate he's a surgeon he's precise uh his greatest strength is the way he controls range just a little out a little in, right on time. Now, the only problem he had that could have been a problem, and it didn't turn out to be a problem, was Ramirez's arms. I mean, his arms are so freaking long, he could reach across the street. And he, because of the length of his arms, every once in a while, Bevo had trouble just judging a little bit of the distance when he stepped out, that he was still in range of those long arms. And even when he laid in front, just out of range, sometimes he got touched. But even when he got touched, he got touched on the gloves. He got, he got touched on the gloves. He didn't get touched clean. And again, I got to remind these judges, please, please understand the protocol of professional scoring. Who lands the cleaner punches? Not who throws. Not who throws. Not who throws. Who lands the cleaner freaking punches? And that was only one man. Yeah, they were both throwing, but only one was landing. Mr. Bevo. And, and, and again, to go back to when the announcers drove me crazy and, and, and drove you crazy. You know, one, one point they said, oh, it's a slugfest now. A slugfest? Who's that, Mickey from Maki? <laughs> uh, 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 there's only one guy getting slugged. The last I checked, you know, oh, this is the fight he wants. This is the fight Ramirez wanted. What, to get punched in the face and not be able to punch the other guy back in the face? That's the fight that he dreamed of? That's the fight that he ordered? You mean he went into a restaurant and he ordered, he, he ordered, okay, give me, give me a platter of uncooked cow's liver. I don't want to eat uncooked cows live i don't know if anyone does i mean that's what is that really what you chose that's what you chose when you were told that the chef would make anything you wanted come into my restaurant tell me what you want you can create the menu that's what no you're not going to create that so you're going to tell me that this fighter wanted a fight where he's going to be getting hit and he can't hit the other guy. That's what the announcers told us. Now he's got the fight he wants. Really? Wow. When we get that LASIK surgery, 
We're going to offer it to announcers. We're going to offer it to judges. We're going to offer it to all people out there because we care. We care about the sport. We want the sport to get better. We care about people that can't see properly, and we want to help them, especially when their ability to see or not see is interfering with their job, okay, with what's being said because it's supposed to be the truth being said. And I'll tell you another thing, speaking of truth, I hope that God Ramirez's corner wasn't lying to him. I have a feeling they were because people don't tell the truth in this sport enough and in this world enough. They don't. They don't. They get mad. Uh, yeah, they, they just want to go along to get along, get along to go along, go along, whatever the frick it is. They, they want to keep getting paid. So they tell everyone, they tell the fighters what they want to hear. No, no. I hope to God that wasn't the truth. I hope that his corner told him the truth because he didn't sound like he was being told the truth. At the end of the fight, in the post-fight, in the, in the uh, interview, where he said, I thought I won. You thought you won? Really? Well, I thought I was the president of Ecuador. And then I woke up and I found out I had to do a podcast with Ken Rideout, okay? Which I'm happy. I'm happy because God, thank God, God, that, that I, I can do that every Monday, really. And with Rob Moore and with all my Twitter team that's there, you know, all those guys. But come on, really? You really did? Your corner was lying to you then. So the only, again, magnificent performance by Bevo. If he wants to become a conductor, a maestro, you know, where he conducts an orchestra, I'm sure there's a job for him when he's finished when he's finished with his boxing. Um he he should have a a long career, longer than maybe most, because he doesn't get hit much. Uh you know, just like Mayweather. There's a reason why Mayweather could stay around so long. He didn't get hit much. He, either does Bevo, despite what the judges would suggest you know i want to look at my notes see if i'm missing anything uh again <laughs> it, it, it's supposed to be about hitting and not getting hit he does that beautifully he really does and listen if there's a weakness and i said this before the fight can if there's a weakness to bevo it's not really a weakness i want to explain it the right way if there's something that can deter from his being continuing to be victorious all the time and stay undefeated. It's the ignorance of the judges. I explain what I mean. Where his one perceived weakness to judges might be that he's so precise, he doesn't waste anything. See, that's a great trait. That's a great strength for me. He doesn't waste a damn thing. He's a surgeon. He don't throw unless he's going to land for the most part. Every once in a while, he throw a couple set-up punches. You know, he sets the table with the left. He eats with the right. And he used the right really well against the southpaw. When southpaws get hit with right hands, I used to say on ESPN, it's the southpaw killer. And he, he did all of that. But he's conservative. He's not going out there just throwing punches to the wind. He's not just throwing punches for the sake of throwing punches. Now, can that be come a weakness with foggy glassed judges um yeah yeah because sometimes if he's not throwing and the other guy's throwing and they're not doing their job right and they're not looking to see who's landing not just throwing maybe they can not give him credit for rounds that he needs credit to continue to win in certain fights that's my one concern is that he leaves the opening, the perception that he could be out hustled, that he could be outworked by certain fighters if they could possibly get close enough to even land on his arms. Um, but that should not be a weakness because it should be what I give it credit for, a strength, that he's that precise, he's that good, he's that in tune with what he's doing. Wow. Wow. He he really is. And I I wanna I think that's my comprehensive breakdown of the fight. And um 
everything that it needs to be. Beaver was the boss all night. At the end of the day, that's what he was. And another thing, besides his great ability to control range, he's got great instincts, Ken, when his opponent is weakening or showing any distress, any sign of distress. He is like a shark that smells blood in the water. And he immediately steps it up. Then he's not as conservative. He, he's, he's still precise. He doesn't waste nothing. He's accurate. But then he steps up his game. Soon as he senses that his opponent is ready to be taken to that next place because of what he did to get him Jenny, there. The one, the one thing that I makes, noticed. That makes that, sense to you? You see that? Of course. Do you see yeah, that 100%. instinct in him? Like he, as soon as he gets a guy a little a little distress bang he he goes to another gear yeah that's what i want to touch on because uh or, or what i want to highlight is because that's the one comment that 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 one of the few comments that the announcers made that i totally agreed with and i thought it was a great observation one of them said early on they said with bevel he throws two three four punch combination early on what maybe even two three by the late rounds, when he starts to get you figured out in time, he's throwing six, seven, eight, nine combinations. And you know, you know who else said that? I saw on social media, our good friend Chem Kilich, who was in camp with us with uh, Alex Vosdick in preparation for the Better BF fight. Chem said the same exact thing on a social media clip before the fight. He said the problem with or well, the strength of Bebo's once he has you figured out, he starts throwing combinations, and you're like caught in the vortex. You can't get out of it. He's cracking you from every direction. He's stepping around. He's like the punches never stop coming when he yeah. figures you out. And it, no, so no, I, I agree. That I he think, did that well. No, I think I said that. But yeah. Yeah, I, you did. I, I'm, I, I'm just, I, I, I agree. I, I agree, counselor. You went over the point <laughs> and, and we drummed it home and hopefully the judge will uh, will will see the case in our favor. Um, and that yes. judge, of course, is the same judge that we're always pre- uh, in front of. And that's the judge of the people's court uh, because that's the court, the court of public opinion. Yes, sir. And so now that we covered that fight, I think properly in every which way um, to Sunday. Yeah, I've got I additional think, questions well, though, because I yeah, want to know I, where where do we go from here? What's next for Bevel? I hope it's better Bev. I think it's got to be better Bev or. For Bevo's sake, I'm sure he hopes it's Canelo because that comes with a mega payday. Mega payday. I mean, probably I would guess five to ten times what he would get for fighting anyone else. Maybe maybe five times what he gets for Better BF. But Better BF to me represents the most dangerous fight for both of them, for Bevo and Better BF. I mean, I think that that's pretty even money from my perspective. But what really matters is the opinion of the expert. So what do you think? What are the odds Bevo, Better BF, if you had to make the line right now? Well... First of all, that's the fight I want to see. It's an interesting, intriguing fight. I I would say better be of just like Bevo have not learned how to lose. They're both undefeated. The difference with better be if he's knocked out everybody. He's broken everyone down. If he doesn't knock you out clean, he he breaks you down. Like we talked about Rockamorph in the earlier fight. His pressure, his mental state his his ability to instill his physicality and his will on you um caves you know just like i talk about all the time pressure breaks pipes better be if looks to break people with that pressure and he has so far every time he's gotten in a ring um i this is the one guy i believe can beat better be if right now better be if it's not getting younger so whatever he's going to do, he better do it soon because he was in a lot of amateur fights and you know a good amount of pro fights and tough fights. He's been on the floor. Um, he ain't getting younger. Sooner or later, that rock will start to wear a little bit, chip a little bit. He's a rock. But you bang on that rock long enough and then one day you come over and you rest on a rock. You just rest on it. You just lean against it and a piece comes off. I don't know how far away he is from that day, but everybody who fights that kind of style gets to that day eventually. Right now, I would make Beaver the favorite. I would make him a slight favorite for Teddy Atlas. I would 
my money, if I had to bet on it, if I'd rather watch it than bet on it. But if I had to bet on it, I'm betting on Bevo. Um, he's the one guy that, here's the key. Yeah, he's got the skill sets. Other guys have too. He's got the skill sets to beat better be of. Other guys have too. But more importantly, he's got the mental approach, the mental togetherness to do it when the fire comes. You know, he can put on an asbestos suit when the fire comes. He he He's not going to get disintegrated by the fire. I think with his background, Bevel, that he has shown me, and I'm going to trust it's there, and I believe it is there, he will have the mental resiliency, the mental endurance to continue to do what he has to do when the fire comes, when the moment comes, you know, and that moment's going to come with better beef, where he's going to keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, and I think where a lot of guys and everyone he's faced so far, he's gotten to. I don't think he gets to Bevel. I don't. That's why I want to see the fight. I want to see if he can. I don't. I'm gonna bet that he can't. That at the end of the day, with all Bevel's physical skills, all the blocks of ability, the 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 bricks of ability. If I use that description, the thing that really makes him into a solid house is the cement that keeps those blocks together when those blocks have to be kept together. And that cement, again, it's his mentality. And I think that mentality, that mental toughness, he's not a talker. He's not any of those things. Those are the toughest guys usually. He's a doer. He's a proud champion. And I believe that that, Mental endurance will allow him to beat this monster, Better Beef. And he's a monster. And listen, where Better Beef is a lot better than Ramirez, first of all, he's a much better puncher. Much better puncher. These announcers were like making it sound like Ramirez was a huge puncher. I, I, I didn't see it. But anyway, that's okay. Um, he's, a much, he's a real good puncher. A TNT puncher with either hand. Better be of. I laughed during the fight again. I giggled a couple times during the fight when the commentators said in the Beaver fight, oh, Ramirez ain't going to the body like he usually does. Well, maybe it's because he couldn't get to the body. Maybe it's because he was getting caught and counted the crap out of every time he tried to get close enough to go to the body. Maybe that's why. Now, that would be a big deal for Better be of, to try to use his hard jab. He's got a very hard jab to kind of control Bevo on the outside. That's the breakdown for the people who are looking forward to this fight. He'd have to use that sledgehammer jab. He don't jab as much as Bevo, but it's hard. Kind of like Foreman's was hard, George Foreman. So he'd have to use that sledgehammer accurate jab to stabilize the boxing on the outside of Bevo. Then he'd have to find a way to get to the body. Take air out of the tires where Beaver does such a magnificent job of, as I said, stepping out, stepping in. You know, start to flatten those tires a little bit. Um, and better be, it was very good at going to the body. So that would be the things that he would have to bring for me for better be to win that fight. Um, I, I really would love to see that fight. I don't want to see Bevo Canelo. I know the great Mexican fans out there want to see it. I don't want to see it again. I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, the more competitive fight, I think, is the one I just said. And I think most real boxing fans would agree with me. But the reason I really don't want to see Canelo, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, I think you know this by now, Ken. I don't mince my words. I don't get afraid of what I'm going to say and people ain't going to like it. I, I say what I believe. And some people like it, some don't like it. That's okay. Um, but you know what? The whole industry is watching this show and listening to this show. We know that already. We have found that out already. And to me, I look at it kind of a little bit like the great Muhammad Ali 
where he used to say, you know, half the people come to my fights because they don't like me. Half come because they love me. But they all come. And uh, as I just appreciate they keep coming. And so I'm going to keep giving them what they come for. Whether they like it or not, most of them like it. The truth. The reason I don't want to see Bevo Canelo 2 is I don't want to give these judges that can be crooked sometimes, I don't want to give them another shot at robbing them because they tried the first time, even though they couldn't because it was so one-sided. I probably had that fight. If my memory serves me correctly, Ken, and you can help me with this, you can chime in here, tell me what you thought. But I probably had it 10 rounds to two or 11 rounds to one for Bevo. I, I couldn't see Bevo, uh, Canelo winning more than two rounds. And they had it close. Uh, even though it was unanimous, they had it much close. And I don't want to give them another shot. I really don't. I don't want to, I mean, you know, if you get your house robbed or almost robbed once, right, what do you do? You put an alarm system in, Ken. You know, if, if you catch exactly. people, if you catch people trying to get into your house, you don't say, "Oh yeah, I'm 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 gonna leave the door open." You know, uh, like I did. No, you're gonna lock the doors. You're gonna put padlocks on the doors. You're gonna get an alarm system. You ain't gonna make it easier for them to rob you again. They already showed 100%. you what they want to do. If there was any opponent other than Canelo calling for a rematch, the the entire community, the the entire boxing world would be saying. Why would they? Why would you deserve a rematch? You got beat in a one-sided fight, and it wasn't even competitive. But because it's Canelo and he brings the audience, people will entertain it. And I don't blame Bebo for doing it. But you're right. Why subject yourself to the potential to have a to have a close fight 100%. that you're definitely going to get robbed? You know that they're going to rob you. I Everyone can, knows that. I think they can 100%. probably even laugh about it at the presser. So I and agree I'm going to go. You. I don't want to. I'm going to go further down the road because the people want me to expect me to. I'm going to break that fight down. I'm afraid that Canelo could possibly make it look a little closer now that he knows more about what Bevo, he's not going to win, but now that he knows more about what Bevo's about, and like I said, sometimes Bevo idles in the driveway. He doesn't get on the highway and go 70 miles an hour. He idles a little bit, and then he gets on the road, he goes 50 to conserve gas. You know, he doesn't go 70 and 80 just to go, just to hit the gas. He only goes when it's time to go, and because of the conservatism in him, maybe Canelo learned a little something from the first time. He jabs a little bit more, he jabs a little bit more, and maybe, you know, he adds a little something to his game where maybe he'll faint a little bit more, you know, to make Bevo make that little step out a little too soon. You know, uh, maybe Canelo will learn from Bevo and change range a little bit on Bevo and not stay in the range he did so much the first time where he got combinations tattooed on his head uh, later in the fight. Maybe he'll learn that. But most importantly, he'll try to take advantage of the spots where Bevo's not hitting the accelerator, even though he's winning, even though he's leading. And he'll try to BS the audience. He'll try to BS the judges. And the problem with these judges, you don't really have to BS them. They're on your side already. Huh, they're in already. You don't have to give them an excuse. See, I'm afraid he could give them an excuse to rob them. The problem, these judges that want to give it to Canelo, you don't have to give them an excuse. You don't have to give them an excuse. They got the excuse. You're the golden goose. You know, they're going to take care of you. So at the end of the day, I, for all those reasons, I want to see better be if and Bevo. Uh, you know, I don't want to see a guy who lost so convincingly get another shot at it. He didn't earn it and get another shot at it when other fighters should get that shot and another shot again with the system, the system, not the fighters, another shot to beat the system where the judges could just screw Bevel. What do you think about that, 
my man. I think you're a hundred percent right. I wouldn't take that fight if I were people. Well, sorry, let me back up. The only reason you have to take it is the money involved. The money, it's incredible. No, I get it. How about this though? I think if he gets better, be of and he can unify the title, do everything he has to do. I mean, if he were to get better, better be and beat him. Aside from moving weight classes, there's no one left there. He's cleaned out the entire division. I think that Bebo would have like one of the greatest pure light heavyweight careers in history if he unifies against Better B if it beats uh and beats Canelo a second time he's going to have more money than he probably ever planned on having and there's nothing else really for him to prove short of like changing weight classes but I don't see I, I, I don't he doesn't strike me as that type of guy he seems like he's very confident and comfortable with who he is why not better to go out ret- go out undefeated on top you've proved everything and you've got enough money to live forever happily ever after so that would be an awesome way to go out, but no, yeah, I agree. I but really again, again, uh, tell show me a guy that turned down the money, and and I'm not saying. I mean, what else would you do? You got to take care of your family. You got to yep. think about the future. You got to secure the future when you can, and so most likely that's what it's going to be. If Canelo's people really want that fight, that'll wind and up I being he because, does. Because, I that'll wind Canelo up being it, it because. That'll wind up being it because of obviously the the most simple thing in the world, money. I mean, yeah. really, the 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 root of all evil, the root of all bad judgments in the world is money. And listen, I, I I'm not contradicting myself. I said it's good judgment because yeah, go grab the money, go grab the money because. You might never get that chance again. Grab it while the grabbing is good and take care. Secure your future for your family. That's why you're in this business. Do it. No doubt about it. My fear is if, if you do that, <laughs> you might do it at your own peril with, again, what I talked about earlier. I talk about things for a reason, that this business, it's not the fighters, it's not the sport that can sometimes let you down. It's the executives and the judges of the sport that can let you down. And that would be my worry. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that that's a real concern. But like I said, if he gets the, uh, if he can get that fight with better BF and beat him at this point, hey, they can, they can, pro- they're going to try to rob him. Then maybe they do. But if you can go out with all the belts and a big bag of money, see ya. Um, with that being said, there's a big UFC fight this coming Saturday night. Israel Adesanya headlining against Alex Perea. Um, and our friend Dustin Poirier is in tough with uh, with um, Michael Chandler from Nashville. Ooh, these two great fights. The whole card is stacked per usual. But more importantly, Teddy, you're going to be working the event. Rob and I will be in attendance at the event. Looking forward to meeting all the fans and seeing all the people there. But um, – Let's just touch on those two fights real quick. I know we haven't prepared the way you would normally do with 52 pages of notes, but what are you looking for in that Chandler Poirier fight? And what does Dustin have to do to get the win? Well, we'll handle the, uh, let's, let's handle the, the Poirier fight uh, first with Chandler. Tough fight. Great fight. It might be the, oh, uh, that fight, that card is loaded. Also, we talk about our friend Dustin and he's coming to the foundation this uh, dinner, and I appreciate the hell out of him for doing that. Um, and people are looking forward to meeting him. But let's not forget, Adesanya's our friend too, and he's been on this show. And he's he, he's special too. And he's in a tough fight. Um, it's a loaded card. But Poirier and Chandler, is I mean, it, it's like going to the 4th of July. I mean, you know you're going to get fireworks. I mean, really, you're not going to the 4th of July, um, you know. Well, you're going there to get hot dogs, hamburgers. Don't get me wrong. I get it. But you're not going there at night to have uh, a quiet, uncolorful night. You're going there to see the skies get lit up and a lot of noise with the banging of the fireworks. And that's what you're going to see if you're going for Poirier and Chandler. These guys don't waste time introducing themselves to you. They're both tremendous offensive forces. Um, it's a tough fight. It's a tough fight for both guys. Poirier is one of the best finishers in the sport. He gets you hurt. He knows how to get rid of you. Um, again, Chandler comes out of the shoot fast. He only knows one gear, first gear, go get you. 
I think he's gotten better, though. I think he's learned. He's been in with nothing but monsters, just like Poirier. Look at these guys' resume. They be, they deserve the best of the best because they fought the best of the best. That's why they're so good. They fought nothing but top guys. And Chandler only came over to the UFC, what, two years ago? And he fought nothing but, first he fought Godzilla, then King Kong, uh, uh, you know? And then he fought the Wolfman. And, and then he, uh, you know what I mean? He, he just... He fights everybody. And like I said, Poirier on his way up, the same thing. He earned his way. So these guys, are they're very similar in, a, in their makeups that way. Uh, Chandler's known as a gunslinger. You know, if you could get him to, you know, to clip off his, his revolver, you know, empty his revolver, you got a shot. You know, you avoid some of those shots early, you got a shot. But... I think he's gotten better. I think he's learned from these tough fights. I think that he's learned to be able to go beyond that first gear, that, that there is a second or third or fourth gear, and that his experience, the confidence from those experiences is teaching him that, that you got to be able to also be there after your initial frontal attack and and i i really think that makes him more dangerous than ever um i'm sure poirier realizes that again uh both guys are gonna look to hurt each other with you know they they do a lot of striking they're they're also i mean dustin's tremendous on the mat they're both tremendous in in all dimensions of of that cage uh I, i'm I don't make any, I don't hide it either to you. We're, we're rooting for Poirier. We have all the respect in the world for both guys. They're both gladiators, but we're rooting for Poirier. It should be a tremendous, tremendous explosion uh, of entertainment and of combat uh, and of teaching. These guys teach you how to behave like warriors when you say oh i want to be a warrior well yeah do you really it, it can hurt it can hurt to be a warrior and if you really want to understand what a warrior is watch these guys not just in how they fight but how they behave how they behave their conduct inside when that conduct is called on is called on so that's that one at his Wow. He's in real tough against the guy who's beat him in kickbox and Alex Perea. Alex Perea, interestingly enough, as a uh, as an MMA fighter, is, o- is only six and one. He's only had seven fights. He lost his first fight by a uh, rear naked rear naked choke submission. And then he stopped and then he stopped every single opponent except for uh, Bruno Silver in the UFC. He won by unanimous decision, but he's KO'd every single opponent that he's beaten. And uh, he has a KO over um uh, over Izzy. So this very interesting matchup here. Uh, man, I'm looking forward to this one. What are you looking for? Yeah, he, uh, listen, the KO over Izzy was, was a while back. It was before Izzy got to the UFC. It was before, it was in kickboxing. Two different sports. Um, both of them, uh, their strengths, both of them, Perea and Adesanya is striking. Uh, they both, Adesanya's done a magnificent job learning how to escape takedowns and survive on the mat and do even more than survive on the mat but he's really invested himself in being dimensional in all areas all facets of the cage pariah as you said big puncher uh you know has a knockout win in kickboxing uh over adesanya so you worry about the mental part the mental part, the mental edge. Does that give, because 75% of this is mental, I always say that. Does that give Pariah an edge that he's got to win over him and a knockout win over him? It potentially could. I don't think it does without a sign. He's special. He's very together mentally. He's very cerebral. And he knows that that's a different time. He knows um, that, you know, where he is now and he understands the mistakes he made 
and I think he's able to kind of, you know, clear the board of that, you know, like erase the, the blackboard of that. And I think Adesanya would be a good golfer where you hit a shot into the woods and then, you know, the next shot, you got to forget about that. You got to hit it on the green. I, I think Adesanya has that ability to put that aside and, and maybe even use it for him where he's been forewarned now, where maybe he wasn't quite as aware of that threat of that dimension, you know, the danger of that dimension of Pariah, uh, Pariah um, in that area where he's that good with the striking or obviously he understood how good he was, but he's more aware now of what to look for. And maybe that, here's a funny thing, a very interesting note, I think, on my part, if it's possible. Adesanya Pariah, both of them, am I pronounce his name, Pereira, Pereira? Pere yeah, Pereira, it's uh, Portuguese, so it looks like Pereira, but I think they say Pereira, I think the R sounds like an H in Portuguese, but I could be, uh, I could be wrong, but I said Pereira. All right, I'll say it in my half Hungarian, half Pereira. Irish, my half Hungarian, <laughs> half Irish way, uh, Pereira. Um, <laughs> but listen, here's the where it could take a little bit of a left-hand turn. Both guys, their strengths undoubtedly striking. Where, is it possible that, now Adesanya, he beat you with striking. He beat you with his legs. He beat you with his versatility. He beat you with his athleticism, his creativeness. He's like Bruce Lee in there sometimes. He makes it up as he goes along. He, you know, he walks to the beat of his own drummer. Um, Perea is more conventional with the boxing. Um, a little bit more of, you know, what is supposed to be, if you will, of what you would expect. Again, just more standard in the boxing in that way. So that is one place where I think Adesanya will take it. He's got great legs. He'll try to give angles to Perea and not give him a chance to unload what he unloaded the you know the time that he knocked out Adesanya where he could be set on his feet in front of you um he'll probably try to give angles change distance like Beevil does keep him off balance don't let him be the puncher you can't be a puncher if you're not set you can't be that destructive banger if your feet aren't set so Adesanya has great wheels great wheels i mean really he he can float i think he's gonna float a little bit use that mix it up keep more balance but here's the what i was alluding to the maybe the little curve does he maybe and this is crazy does he maybe take him to the floor does he maybe take him to the floor even though we know both these guys strengths are standing but Adesanya has improved in that area to the point where he's a very cerebral guy. His Eugene, his trainer, very smart. Where maybe they say, let's mix it up and go and do what he don't expect. Go to the floor a little bit. Stay away from the one place he can beat us. The one place he can beat him, Ken, is standing. So maybe he takes yep. it to the floor, which you would never expect in an Adesanya fight. Never. You'd expect him to survive the floor, expect him to be like those great quarterbacks in, in the NFL that escape the pocket and escape the sack because they have escapability, and Adesanya has escapability. You'd never think that you'd see him purposely want to go to the floor. I'm saying that maybe, maybe that's a thought in this fight plan for them in such an important fight for both fighters and obviously for Adesanya in being able to continue to be the champion and continue to be the force he's been at all at at middleweight you know the the I mean really the 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 premier guy at middleweight um his only loss in the UFC is when he went up to light heavyweight uh you know and he 
he fought a hell of a fighter there, Blahovich, I think. And yeah, and the guy, that's right. not only was Blahovich too strong on the mat, but he was smart. He was good. He was good with striking. Was he was say, good on the floor. Blahovich fought a perfect uh, fight. Oh, uh, uh, he fought a perfect fight. And at the end, he he got the geography he needed more than Adesanya did on the mat, and used his physicality, his physical advantages of strength that way. So, I'll be um, I'll be at the Garden covering it for ESPN with the great Charlie Monahan, the director producer of all things UFC with ESPN, and I I look forward to the whole card. I just broke down those two fights, but the whole card is magnificent. It's it's you know up to snuff of what you expect from UFC Dana White you know it's his way or the highway all competitive fights all tough fights you know you go on some of these cards in boxing unfortunately I know I've said it before and before and before I say it again maybe somebody will get wise to it and you are uh, the undercard is garbage you know it's it's a joke they're just they're just building up the guys in their stable, they're building up their record with cannon fodder, you know, with guys that shouldn't be in the ring with them. But not the case in the UFC. All tremendous fights. I think that as I broke down the Adesanya, uh, I think that there's going to be a little bit more. There's always the cerebralness with the top guys because even though they're savages, even though you know uh, they look like cavemen, no, they're 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 smart cavemen. You know what I mean? They're smart cavemen. They learn how to make fire. Uh, they 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 learn how to you know put clothing on their backs and and you know stay warm. Uh, the the top guys are the guys that understand the science. That are not just smart, but they're uh, not just tough, but they're smart. You know, like I say to my fighters, Ken, you've been in camp with me. Be a smart monster. Be a smart. And these guys are all smart monsters. Um, I think that it will be very interesting to see the strategy in both fights, particular the Adesanya Pereira fight, because of the way I described it, where you're going to have those dimensions where. You might have the option of Adesanya going somewhere we never thought he would go, maybe purposely going to the floor um, to stay away from the strengths. The one place that Pereira can beat him, uh, which is standing, even though Adesanya can beat him standing too. So does he just beat him standing or does he mix in going to the floor? All of that stuff, I think it makes for great drama, great theater, great suspense. I can't wait for my son is flying in from Vegas. He's going to be with me. I hope to see you guys there. Um, I'm going to talk to my man, Charlie. I know he watches all the shows. Charlie, this is my way of calling you. Uh, I'd like to get Ken and Rob into the suite if we can, um, just to see them while they're there. They already have tickets. They're probably, if Ken's not too busy signing autographs, I'll see if I can get them up <laughs> to our suite. Um, to spend some time together. But either way, I look forward to being there with my son with me, uh, hopefully seeing you guys and being able to report the following Tuesday, even though we do it on Monday, the following Tuesday about a great, great card. Well, Teddy, one of the things that uh, I hope Izzy is doing is getting to uh, New York in plenty of time to give his body time to adjust to the time change because he's coming all the way from New Zealand. And you know what else comes all the way from New Zealand? Our favorite daily supplement, Athletic Greens, AG1. And these travel packs are perfect for someone like Izzy who's on the road. Throw these in the suitcase, bang, you get your 75 whole food source ingredients, Vitamins, minerals, probiotics, prebiotics, especially when you're A, traveling, B, cutting weight, C, preparing for a physical endeavor such as a fight, a marathon, whatever it is, a big meeting. You'd be crazy to go in there without all your weapons. And one of those weapons is your brain. You got to keep it nourished. Keep yourself fueled. Mix this athletic greens travel pack with 8 to 12 ounces of water. Shoot it down in the morning on empty stomach. It tastes great. It's easy to consume, and it gets all your bases covered. Even if you're eating the healthiest whole food source diet every single day, it's impossible to get everything you need just from food, although 
as we know, whole foods are nature's vitamins and minerals. But you should always be supplementing with Athletic Greens to make sure you're getting everything you need. Go to athleticgreens.com, use the promo code ALICE, and they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase so you're never left empty-handed when you're on the road. Athleticgreens.com, use the promo code ATLAS, A-T-L-A-S. And with that, Teddy, that was a thorough, thorough breakdown of all the action that happened this weekend, what we've got coming up next weekend. I'm excited to see you this week, and I know the fans will be excited to see you on ESPN. Congrats again to our friend Rob Moore, fourth place. Went out on his shield, fighting for the win. 112 was his time, which is still an insanely fast half marathon. The winners ran 518 pace at 109. Man, impressive. I'm going to run a half marathon myself on December 3rd in Memphis. Try to win the Memphis half marathon. And, um, yeah, that's it. That's a full breakdown. If you're watching the show, please subscribe. Please leave a comment. It really matters to us, honestly. If you're watching on YouTube, just subscribe. We're not spamming you. We're only sending you the updates when we re- when we release a new show. That's the only notification you'll get. Uh, get. And uh, we appreciate all the fans, and thank you for all the support. And, Teddy, I'll see you this weekend. Look forward to it uh, very much. And, again, what I started to show with, besides giving the proper kudos to our man Rob, go out and vote. Use that great, great right in this country that was given to you by many people that died to make sure you had that right. Go out there and fire some of those uh, politicians that work for you if you think they've been doing a bad job. God bless everybody. See you guys.